Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, thank you very much for, um, for being here today. We are, as we mentioned yesterday, very, very excited to have you. This is the formal public launch of our meeting on and our, of the Commission on health, equi and health, I'm sorry, on equity and health inequalities in the Americas. Um, as most of you know, this is um, uh, essentially a continuation of yesterday's work, but this is our official public launch within the organization. And for a very brief introduction and welcome, um, we have here with us a very distinguished panel. First of all, allow me to introduce myself for those of you that um, were not here yesterday. My name is Heidi Jimenez and I'm the legal counsel for PAHO, here representing uh, the cross-cutting themes of the organization um, within the component of human rights. Uh, to my left is Dr. Luis Andres de Francisco. He's our director of the Department of Family, Gender, and Life Course. To my immediate right, uh, is our assistant director, Dr. Francisco Becerra. In the middle, I am very pleased to introduce to you Dr. Carissa Etienne. She is the director of the Pan American Health Organization. And all the way to our right is Professor Michael Marmot, who is the chair of the commission. So without further ado, I will pass the word over to our director. I'm sorry. Our Deputy Director, Dr. Isabella Danel, just joined us at the end of the table. So um, as you could see, we have um, a very distinguished panel here with very distinguished guests. So without further ado, I'm very pleased to introduce to you Dr. Carissa Etienne. Thank you very much. Thank you, Heidi, and good morning. You, you know, there is a, a quiet air of excitement in the room, and, and it, it's, it's almost palpable. And, and so it's so good to be here this morning. And I want to begin by extending a very warm welcome to all of you. Despite the weather outside, it is very sunny here, so good morning. Um, I, I want to acknowledge all our country representatives, our international health experts, uh, our representatives from ministries of health, uh, PAHO staff, and members of the public. I, I believe that PAHO is privileged. We are privileged that people of your expertise, of your caliber, of, of your passion and your interest, that you are participating in this launch today, and that you, through your participation, you are lending your support to the work that will ensue over the next two years. I, I just wanted to tell you that today I need to welcome Jackie as well. She's the staff member that is spending the day with the director. So we are beginning a new program where a, a staff member gets to spend the day with the director. So I had to tell her that my day started at 4.30, but <laughs> she missed that path. <laughs> but certainly for those of you who are jo joining us this morning, we are delighted to have your participation. You are here at the beginning of what is an exciting two-year partnership among the Pan American Health Organization, the Institute of Health Equity at the University College London, our participating member states, and the newly appointed Commission on Equity and Health Inequalities in the region of the Americas. I want to publicly express our thanks to all of the members of the commission who have accepted to serve this organization and beyond this to serve the peoples of the Americas through this work that um, they will be undertaking. The partners met for the first time yesterday to discuss plans for the review and to discuss the conceptual basis of this commission and the gaps that we expect to fill. PAHO has commissioned the review of equity and health inequalities in the Americas to address one broad and pervasive problem with a variety of dimensions. You know that it is very often quoted that the region of the Americas is the most inequitable region, and, and health inequalities also are very pervasive. We believe that factors that should not determine health outcomes are in fact designing them for an enormous number of people in the Americas. Characteristics such as gender, ethnicity, 
legal and socioeconomic status are among the greatest risk factors for ill health, injury, and mortality across the Americas. As the regional authority mandated to support member states in improving health outcomes, it is our core task to identify the ways in which these factors influence health and to close this inequity gap wherever possible. The truth is that inequalities in health status and outcomes threaten progress, they threaten sustainable human development. Governments and countries in this region are continuing to roll out interventions in their, in their quest and their attempt to address this inequity. But what we are seeing is that interventions that are not strategically targeted at inequality may actually exacerbate it by inadvertently favoring those members of society who enjoy visibility, who enjoy power and economic advantage. And this, I know that you will agree with me, is an unacceptable state of affairs. And, and I suggest that few would tolerate this state, status if we were better equipped to address it. And, and this is my hope, and it is this hope on which is predicated the work that we will do. I know that every one of you here today in this room, that you share the common concern. And the core purpose of this commission is to help expand our knowledge of the problems of health inequality and to give greater clarity as to how these dynamics are playing out in the region of the Americas and to define recommendations for what actions will be effective in ending them. Of course, in undertaking this ambitious work, we recognize that we stand, as it were, on the shoulders of giants. Previous programs of work, including the Commission for the Social Determinants of Health, led by our own Commission Chair, Sir Michael Marmot, have done much to investigate the aspects of in inequities in health. In this regional approach, we are choosing to highlight the dynamics between four cross-cutting themes, namely gender, ethnicity, human rights, and equity. PAHO has established the cross-cutting themes secretariat and working group to ensure that these themes are mainstreamed effectively across all our entities and all our programs. And, and this cross-cutting uh, approach had been, has been adopted several years um, ago, but was given much more emphasis within our current strategic plan for 2014-2019. A central component of the success of the commission will be the contributions and commitment of the participating member states. And those member states are represented here today, and let me, let me also thank the member states for accepting to be part of this, of this study. Although the Commission will incorporate issues and make recommendations that are relevant to the entire region of the Americas, these 14 countries will play an active and continuous role in supporting it. They will supply the evidence and knowledge of national issues and priorities, which will be indispensable in ensuring that the review is relevant and grounded. And for this reason, country expectations and perspectives are crucial considerations in the implementation of the review. These issues of conceptual clarity, the interactions between themes, and how participating countries can both support and benefit from the review were among some of the discussions and interesting points that you, um, you deliberated upon yesterday. I, I really would like to, to say that uh, PAHO, and I've spoken to some of the, of the staff who were present at the discussions yesterday, um, that we are delighted with the level of discourse that we have heard during the meeting this far, thus far. But I'm the first to recognize that we have far to go, and there is much to cover during both the public launch this morning and the remainder of the commission and meeting um, that will conclude this afternoon. 
So l allow me to conclude by reflecting on the importance of landing this agenda at this time. And, and my staff will always tell you I'm talking about landing because unless the plane lands, it's, it's in the air and it's, it's not practical and not affecting the lives of people. I think the advent of the Sustainable Development Agenda, the 2030 Agenda, poses a challenge to us all to build a more equitable and sustainable world in every dimension, from education to environment to health. By looking critically at the fundamental sources of the inequity that frustrate our efforts in, to improve health and human development, we open up a world of 2030 and the possibility that that can be a better world. And this is, this is my fervent hope, my fervent desire. We cannot continue as we are. In 2030, we have to ensure, we have to lead the efforts that will ensure that the disadvantaged people, the people who are living in conditions of vulnerability, that they have the possibility of good health and well-being. This is what I want to dedicate. So by 2030, will I be still around? Yeah. But I want to dedicate certainly the rest of my own public health career and beyond. So some of them are, some people here are going beyond, like, like David. David has gone well beyond his, his public health um, career. Um, into retirement, but he's still dedicated to getting this done. So for my rest of my public health life but, and beyond, I, I would like to dedicate um, myself to, to, to this work. I believe that by looking critically at the fundamental sources of the inequity that we can begin to do this. So let me, um, let me begin by saying that also, that conclude by saying also that the lessons and the um, information that we will glean from this work over the next two years, I hope that it will be useful not only for the region, but for other regions and for the rest of the world. Um, because we need to make progress at the global level as well. So I want to thank you again for being part of this transformative moment and to urge us all to take advantage of the opportunities presented by this commission. We have a chance not merely to understand what equity in health should look like, but the exact reasons why this is not a reality yet and what we have to do to get us there. We can do this with the commitment, energy, and expertise of our commissioners and participating countries and all of our partners. And again, I'm very, I'm very grateful to our partners for joining us today um, in this launch. And, and hopefully, you will stay um, involved and connected, and you will continue to ask questions of, this, of the organization, of the commission, as we, as we continue. So I'm truly excited to see what the next two years brings, um, because with all of the strengths that we see represented here, it can only augur for, um, for good. Um, so it is really my great pleasure to introduce to you Professor Sir Michael Marmot, who is our commission chair and who will tell you more about the aims of the review and what it will entail. Um, and thank you again for joining us here today. And thank you again um, that you've joined us not merely for the launch, but like us, that you will be in it for the long run. So thank you so much. and we look with great anticipation to, to the results. So. I wanted to see. Perdón, no hay micrófono. As, as most of you were Como la mayoría de ustedes que estuvieron aquí ayer, pensé que en lugar de repetir lo que dije ayer, podría leer de mi libro. 
y entonces eh, siéntense, pónganse cómodos y es hora de leer mi libro. El capítulo 8. Capítulo 8. En mayo 2011, Mary se ahor ahorcó. Se la encontró en el jardín de la casa de sus abuelos en una reserva de una provincia del, de British Columbia del Canadá. Ella tenía 14 años. Era la primera canadiense aborigen y su historia tiene unos detalles que también se vio que era abusada físicamente y emocionalmente en su casa y en su comunidad y posiblemente abusada sexualmente. Y no era estable, escuchaba voces, cosas que se atribuían a un sistema de mal manejado de bienestar social y el hecho de que nadie tomó sus quejas de abuso seriamente ni hicieron nada al respecto. Hay otra manera de ver la historia corta y triste de Mary y es de reconocer que aunque su traje, tu tragedia era única o singular, hay otros canadienses aborígenes que han experimentado tragedias similares. De hecho, el usuario común de aborigen de, de British Columbia es cinco veces más y uno no puede entender plenamente por qué Mary no encontró un camino de salida sin preguntarse también por qué otros aborígenes jóvenes en British Columbia del Canadá llegaban al mismo punto de desesperación. Los dos profesores que estudiaron este tema señalaron que en British Columbia habían 200 bandas de canadienses de primera nación que vivían en pobreza y, lo, y en lo que, los descri, lo que describieron una pobreza extrema. Sin embargo, en los primeros seis años del estudio, el 90% de los suicidios ocurrieron en el 12% de las bandas. La pregunta es, ¿qué es lo que diferenció a aquellos con alta, altos niveles de suicidio a los de eh, tasa intermedia y baja de suicidios? Y como soy maestro de todo, hago un clic y aquí vemos. Los clasificaron a, las clasificaron a las comunidades según seis indicadores de lo que yo llamaría el empoderamiento de la comunidad. El autogobierno, la participación en reclamos de tierras y control de la comunidad de los servicios de salud, educación, cultura y policía y bomberos. M cuanto más de los seis es existen, Seis existían más bajo la más baja la tasa de suicidio, donde las comunidades estaban chillingly young people and their lives. I highlight this because in countries throughout the region, rich, middle income and poor we have huge issues of inequalities in health. Canada ranks second or third on the Human Development Index. Um, it's a wonderful country, but there are patterns like this that have to be addressed. In the US, I write in here, and tempting as it is to continue reading from my book. I'll spare you that pleasure, um, but we can have a special reading at five o'clock this afternoon for <laughs> those who've got nothing better to do. I write here about inequalities in health in Baltimore. And I was about to talk about Baltimore last year in the US when Baltimore erupted. As you know, the precipitant of the civil unrest in Baltimore was the killing of a black man 
in police custody. Or should I say one more killing of a black man in police custody. That was the precipitant. But the underlying cause was inequality. Inequality of social and living conditions. And as I say, I wrote about Baltimore because in Greater Roland Park, Poplar area, the nice leafy area, life expectancy was 83. In Upton Druid, the inner city part, life expectancy was 63. And when I say Baltimore erupted, in fact, Baltimore didn't erupt. It was the inner city part that erupted. This is really serious. If we want whole of government to address these issues, and whole of government may not be interested in health, but they're certainly interested in civil unrest. And I don't think that ill health causes civil unrest, and I don't think that civil unrest causes ill health, at least not in the immediate term. But I think inequality of social and economic conditions causes both the likelihood of civil unrest and it causes ill health. I was at a meeting at Johns Hopkins, one of the world's great universities, and a couple of young doctors kidnapped me and said, you can't just sit here in this august university and not see Baltimore. So they took me to, thank you, they took me to Upton Druid in Upton Druid, where LeSean grew up, half of single parent families, median household income in 2010 was $17,000. Kids do poorly in school. More than 50% missed at least 20 days of high school. 90% did not go on to college. Each year, a third of young people aged 10 to 17 are arrested for a juvenile disorder. Each year, one third. That means the probability of getting to age 17 without an arrest is vanishingly small. I don't believe it works, but there we go. We'll try. <laughs> the slate is supposed to be wiped clean at 18. Can you imagine you apply for a job at 18 and they say, have you ever been arrested? You could lie. That's not a very good qualification for a job. Or you could tell the truth. And that's not a very good qualification for a job. So these young people's lives are blighted by growing up in this environment. It, between 2005 and 2009, there were 100 non-fatal shootings for every 10,000 residents and nearly 40 homicides. And then we move to the nice green leafy area of Roland Park, 93% two-parent families, median family income, $90,000. The kids do well in reading. They don't miss school, 75% completed college. Juvenile arrests, one in 50. Not one third, one in 50. No non-fatal shootings and homicides, four per 10,000, not 40. Life expectancy of 63 for men in the poorest part of Baltimore. Keep that in mind. Most of you know what the range of life expectancy is in the countries of the Americas. But keep that in mind, what the people in the deprived part of Baltimore. And keep in mind, Keep in mind that the household income was $17,000 in the poor part. Now, think about countries in the region and what populations of those countries would give to have a household income of $17,000 at purchasing power parities. Wow, we're rich. We made it. We all won the lottery, $17,000. Yet, that puts people at the very bottom of the heap in Baltimore. We have to address the issue that it's not 
just absolute amounts of money that matter. Why do we need a regional commission? We want to tackle health inequalities which are driven by inequities in gender, ethnicity, social, economic, environmental, cultural and political factors. We're going to have to be a little bit selective in how much of this we're able to deal with. And application of human rights approaches. I meant to welcome my colleague and friend David Satcher who was unable to be with us yesterday but will be a member of the Commission. And David, we had a terrific first discussion with commissioners yesterday of what a, taking a more explicit human rights approach would mean to making progress. And uh, it's going to set a new agenda. Governance for equity in human rights and advocacy for prioritization. And the issues we're dealing with are big inequalities in health between and within countries, gradients in health. We had a lot of discussion, rightly, about the poor health and poor living and social circumstances of indigenous populations. But inequalities are not confined to poor health for those who've been most unfairly treated. In fact, there's a social gradient that runs all the way from top to bottom. The particular circumstances of the Americas to which the director alluded in her opening remarks are going to be key for us and the importance of data. Look at this, percent of births not registered in Bolivia, nearly a quarter of births are not registered. To use the old adage, if you're not counted, you don't count. And it's hard to make progress when we haven't got good data, when we don't really know what's going on. So this huge range in the countries of the region in the percent of births not registered. Life expectancy at birth I'm going to do a test, by the way, for the people who were here yesterday, of which slides I've shown twice. A clue. I showed this one. You get that one for free. Um, <laughs> but afterwards, I'm going to do a test. Um, life expectancy of birth for females varies from 66 to 85, and from 62 to 80 for males. And I asked you to remember that life expectancy in the poor part of Baltimore was 63 for men. That puts them down in Haiti or Bolivia. What on earth is going on? In every country of the region, from north to south, we have to address these issues. And it means we've got to make common cause for all the countries of the region, because we're addressing a common set of causes. And as many of you have heard me say, the causes of the causes. And I show it to show this overlap. I'm cheating on this one. This is a different version of the Preston curve. It's not the one I showed yesterday. But it, it makes the point that when I talk about inequality, and it's not, not just absolute amounts of money, absolute amounts of money really matter if you haven't got any. If you're a poor country, increasing national income a bit is associated with a big increase in life expectancy. And think about a household, not that I want to make too close a parallel between income of countries and income of households, but if you haven't got enough money as a household, a bit of money makes a difference. If you can pay the rent, have heating, have food for the children. A bit of money makes a difference. But when you get to a given level of national income, around $10,000, it's a scatter. There's very little relation. The clue to getting healthier as a country is not just getting richer. Social circumstances matter much more. 
And I show this just to remind us that although there are still major issues of infectious disease in the region, overwhelmingly, look at Haiti, death rates from circulatory disease, overwhelmingly, we have to be addressing non-communicable disease. It doesn't mean that tuberculosis is gone, not at all. It doesn't mean we don't have to be concerned with new viruses, not at all, we do. But overwhelmingly, we need to be looking at non-communicable disease, and that's circulatory disease in males. So no country in the region is immune from these problems. This has to be part of our concern. I began this morning by talking about suicide, uh, but homicide and social and economic conditions are vitally important to violent deaths of all forms. Under five mortality rates, again, show dramatic differences. And I said yesterday, and I'll say it again today, that no child should die under five. The right rate, if there is such a thing, is perhaps five per thousand live births. It's, we see less than five in Canada. Wonderful. I'm sure no one in Canada is complacent about this issue. If it's five, you'd probably want it to be three. Um, so no one's complacent about it. But no child should die. We know how to prevent this. This is not lack of biological understanding that leads the rates to be so much and so dramatically higher in some countries than others. And we can make a difference really quickly. I remind you of the gradient, that it's not just the poorest. This is looking by education. The greater the degree of maternal education, the lower the under five mortality for Peru and this dramatic improvement over time. This is the kind of evidence on which I base my statement that we can make a big difference really quickly. Why are we doing this now? Why are we having this commission now? We need to build on the knowledge that's out there on social determinants and the health and all policies approach, which is a way of implementing knowledge on social determinants. We want to give new emphasis to gender and ethnicity, more than we've done before, to incorporate human rights approaches and mechanisms, and crucially, to build on the sustainable development goals. I th the why now, I think the SDGs give, gives, give, the goals give. The existence of the SDGs gives us uh, an opportunity uh, to make real progress now. Two years, commissioners, country partners, 14 countries, and task groups. The 17 goals with which you're familiar can be a bit daunting. On the one hand, three is on good health and well-being, and 10 on reduced inequalities, but all of them potentially have some relevance to our agenda. And a key task as we go forward is for countries not to be swamped by the task of measurement, 169 indicators for 17 goals, and underpinning the 169 indicators probably scores more measurements. So for countries not to be swamped um, by the task of doing all of this, from, I think, the Commission's point of view, we want to simplify this, use the push, the dynamic of the SDGs for better measurement, but get a simplified measurement structure that will serve the purpose of our Commission on Equity and Health Inequalities. Data, evidence, advocacy, action, lots of important things that we'll be doing. Let me just give you 
a few examples of the kind of issues that we have to deal with. This is the ratio of income between women and men in Latin America and secondary education. If you look first at secondary education, you'd say, wow, that's pretty good. Women to men, it's pretty close to one in most countries, a bit lower, Bolivia, Mexico, a bit lower than one, a bit higher than one in Venezuela and Brazil, pretty good. Now look at income, oh dear. Women's income versus women have 0.7%, uh, 0.7, 70, 71% of the income of men in Colombia, 61% in Bolivia, 60% in Brazil, 59% in Peru. So they're doing as well in secondary education. My guess is this is not simply a cohort effect. We're waiting for it to feed through the better education. This is continuing discrimination by gender throughout the region. I don't think we can address gender inequities in health without addressing these kind of gender inequities. Employment policy is health policy. But look at the issue of informal employment for males and females in Colombia. Informal employment, so without a contract of employment, it's been coming down for men in Colombia, but not nearly as rapidly for women. So it's still more than 55% of women in Colombia in informal employment. Informal employment means probably worse pay, no security of employment, worse employment conditions, lack of protection from the usual laws and so on that apply. And in country after country, it's affecting women more than men. But I always see good things going on in Colombia. The percent below the national poverty line has been coming down from nearly 50% in 2002 to 30.6% in 2013. In fact, when I was in Colombia and showed this slide, Colombian colleagues said, where did you get those data from? Um, I looked them up from the World Bank. Um, it shows the importance of data. Coming back to, to Canada, household food insecurity, moderate or severe, by income quintile, not surprisingly, people in the top income quintile have very little, very low prevalence of food insecurity. Quintile four, some, quintile three, more. And in fact, it went up between 2007, eight and 2011, 12. So food insecurity means <laughs> They've got some very strict definitions, but it might mean children missing meals. Children missing meals in Canada. This comes from Canadian colleagues, um, and you see the gradient. So it's not confined to people in the bottom quintile. Income inequality among OECD countries. Mexico, as you know, is now an OECD country. And if you look at that country that's had the biggest increase in the Gini coefficient, index of income inequality, is Mexico. Most of the OECD countries see rising inequality, but Mexico, which already had very large income inequalities, has been going up. The good news is it's been coming down in Greece. We'd all like to have an economy just like that of Greece. Um, so maybe that's not such good news. Um, but a steep rise in Mexico, uh, a major challenge. I might have said the why now, because the challenge now of increase in equality in country after country and Paolo was talking about this yesterday. We know the damage this does to the health and well-being of our populations. 
there is a tendency to see public health in very downstream terms. You're too fat. Lose weight. Eat sensibly. If you're overweight, you've got no one to blame but yourself. There is a tendency to think that way. If we look at global be mean body mass, in body mass index for males 20 and above, 1980, focus on the Americas. It's gone up dramatically. And the US by state, you've seen these figures. Just pause on this for a moment. If you think that being overweight is a matter of low moral fiber, if you think people have no one to blame but themselves for getting overweight, why did the population of the Americas suddenly have an outbreak of fecklessness? They had an outbreak of low moral fiber. Why did the US suddenly all, over time, lose the ability to control themselves? <coughs> but when it came to smoking, they were remarkably responsible because smoking levels have come down dramatically. What on earth is going on here? People are morally wonderful when it comes to smoking and morally corrupt when it comes to eating. We have to look colleagues, at the causes of the causes. We have to look at the environment that promotes overweight and obesity, the social determinants of obesity. Paolo, this is for you. You said we need to talk about public expenditure and the role that plays. These are European countries looking at net total social expenditure and purchasing power parities. And the odds of being in poor health by education. So the top graph is primary education, then secondary, and the bottom one, tertiary education. And you can see that countries that spend very little socially, there's worse health, but that worse health affects people with middle level of education and primary education much more. So the inequalities are bigger. The more generous a country's social expenditure, the better the health and the narrower the health inequalities. It's an evidence base for saying social expenditure is good for health and good for narrowing health inequalities. And from the UNDP, what we've got here is log of public expenditure on, they say health, but they mean health care log of public expenditure on health care and education in 2000 and the Human Development Index, which includes literacy, gross national product, and life expectancy 12 years later. Now, as I've said, you could have a class of graduate students spend a whole semester discussing causality of how the causal relations run. But at least one explanation of this, if yours is the kind of country that invests publicly in education and healthcare and social protection, yours is the kind of country that's gonna have good level of development. And to come back to finish with what I showed you yesterday, the reasons for optimism, that inequality between countries can get smaller very quickly. I pointed out life expectancy in Peru in the 50s, 43 in the US, 66, a 23 year gap in life expectancy, and 50 years later, that gap had narrowed to seven years. And in Brazil, when we look at the social gradient in stunting in the first year of life, uh, what we see is a steep social gradient in 1974-5, somewhat shallower in 89, shallower still in 96, and shallower still in 2006-7. That may well 
have something to do with Bolsa Familia, with Brazil's national program to reduce poverty. What did you say? 40 million people um, had poverty reduced in Brazil by conditional cash transfer programs. And we see this flattening of the social gradient in stunting in the first year of life. We can make a difference really quickly. We need to marshal the evidence. And as colleagues said yesterday, a key task for this commission is addressing the issue of why is the evidence not being acted on? What do we have to do to make progress in people acting on the evidence that we have? We coined this when we did our European review of social determinants in the health divide, but it would apply, I would say, well to the countries of the Americas. Health is a human right, but we said that if a country's doing very little in addressing equity and health inequalities, do something. It would make a difference. And if a country's being active and doing things, do more. And if you're one of the more advanced countries of the region with respect to action on equity and health inequalities, do it better. There's something here for all of us. I want to finish on a note. David Satcher's heard me say this before, but it came up when I was talking to colleagues from Colombia last night. And as it does, the conversation turned to Don Quixote. And I said, well, I had a particular need to read Don Quixote in English translation, I'm afraid to say, not in the original Spanish, because when I started chairing the WHO Commission on Social Determinants of Health, I felt like Don Quixote. I felt like I'd woken up one day with some delusion that I was a knight who was running around doing chivalrous deeds, and people were laughing at me ever so gently. And so I thought Don Quixote was a good model. And I said this to the Minister of Health in Spain. He said, ah, but don't forget Sancho Panza. He said, we need Don Quixote the dreamer. We need to have dreams. We need the practical tools to make our dreams reality.